when you start thinking about investing, maybe saving for something big. The advice you always seem to hear is, well, it's all about risk and reward, right? Like, everyone says stocks are riskier, they bounce around more, but that's why they supposedly pay more over time. It feels intuitive. Uh-huh. That's definitely the standard story. And, you know, that basic idea that investors need to be paid more for taking on more risk has been central to finance theory for, well, decades. Since the 60s, really. They call it risk theory. Yeah, risk theory. Huh. And the usual way they measure that risk is with something called variance. Variance. Okay. Which is basically just a measure of how much the price of something, like a stock, tends to jump around its average. Both up and down jumps count. So higher jumps, more variance, equals more risk. That's the core idea. More risk, so you should demand a higher expected return to be willing to hold it. Okay, I think I get that. It's like um, choosing a job, maybe. One's super steady, same pay every month, predictable. Right. Low variance. And the other, well, the pay's all over the place. Some months great, some terrible. High variance. You probably only take that second unpredictable job. If you expected, on average, to make significantly more money over the year, wouldn't you? Exactly. That extra expected pay is your compensation for dealing with the uncertainty, the variance in your income. Or climbing mountains. Mm. A little hill walk is, you know, low risk, maybe in a cave view. Easy stroll. But Everest, that's huge risk, huge variance in conditions. Yeah. You wouldn't attempt it unless the potential reward, the view, the achievement felt massively greater. Perfect analogy. And finance traditionally treats that variance symmetrically. A big price jump up is measured the same way mathematically as a big price crash down. It's just a deviation from the average. Right. Seems logical. Yeah. Solid framework. Thanks. But the source material we're looking at today says this whole risk theory based on variance has, and I quote, largely failed mm -hmm. when you test it against real world history. Uh -huh. How can something so you know, logical just not match up with the data? Well, this is where it gets really fascinating. Because when you dig into the long term data, the predictions from that simple risk reward story they often just don't hold up. There are some major empirical puzzles. Puzzles? Like what? Well, one of the classic ones is called the equity premium puzzle. Okay. Researchers like Mara and Prescott looked at U.S. stock returns over a very long history, and they found stocks actually earned way more than risk theory predicted they should have, just based on their volatility, their variance. Wait, they paid too much compared to the risk? Yeah, the premium, the extra return over safer assets like bonds seemed excessive. Like your analogy earlier, if the recipe says bake for 30 minutes, but it's perfectly done in 10, a much better outcome than expected for the effort or risk involved. Huh. Okay. So that's one crack in the theory. Stocks sometimes paid more than expected, but does it go the other way too? Oh, absolutely. And this is perhaps even more striking. The source highlights the very long-term comparison between U.S. stocks and long-term government bonds. The classic stocks versus bonds debate. Exactly. And you know the common wisdom, Stocks are riskier, so they must outperform bonds over the long run. Yeah, that's what everyone says. Stocks for the long run. Well, look at the actual U.S. historical data going back over 200 years. An investor starting in, say, 1804 okay. would have had to wait 97 years. 97? Almost a century just to see their stock investment accumulate more wealth than if they'd simply held long government bonds. Wow. That's, a, that's somebody's entire lifetime, maybe more. It is. And think about what that does to the idea of long run. 97 years is multiple generations. And incredibly, the source shows that even after finally pulling ahead, stocks actually fell behind bonds again later after 129 years before eventually taking the lead for good much later. That's just mind blowing. It's like uh, training super hard for a marathon, you know, taking all that risk and effort, mm -hmm. expecting to always beat the casual jogger in the long run. But sometimes, even over decades, the jogger's ahead, or you fall behind again. It completely messes with that simple narrative, doesn't it? Patience in stocks doesn't automatically guarantee a reward proportional to risk over any long period you choose. But it wasn't just some weird 19th century thing. Not at all. The source shows data, figure two, I think, with rolling 10-year periods across the last 220 years. And you see recurrent stretches lasting a decade or more where U.S. stocks significantly underperformed long bonds. These aren't just quick dips, they're sustained periods. The whole higher risk, higher reward thing, mm -hmm. it just wasn't consistently true, even over decades. Precisely. And it's not just a U.S. phenomenon either. The research looked at 19 international markets. Okay. And every single one of them had at least one period, lasting 20 years or more, where Starks underperformed their government bonds. Every single one. Yep. 
Think about Norway for the 20 years ending 1938. Or Italy and Japan, major economies. Yeah. They had stocks underperform bonds for 50 years, ending in 2011. 50 years. Wow. It really challenges that universal risk pays idea. This long-term underperformance seems pretty common globally. And didn't the source also mention something about, like, other types of risk factors, like mm -hmm. investing in small companies or value stocks? That those didn't consistently pay off either. That's right. Finance tried to get more sophisticated, identifying factors beyond just overall market risk, like company size or whether a stock looks cheap based on its fundamentals, its value. Right. I've heard of size and value factors. The idea was these also represented kinds of risk that should earn a premium. But again, the historical data shown in figure four in the source is messy. There are long, multi-decade periods where these factors did seem to deliver extra returns, as expected. But then there are other long, multi-decade periods where they delivered lower returns than expected, despite their supposed risk. The consistency just isn't there over time. Okay, so let me get this straight. The basic idea you get paid more for taking on more risk, measured by how much prices jump around it, doesn't explain why stocks sometimes paid way too much historically. Correct. The equity premium puzzle. And it really doesn't explain why stocks the supposedly riskier asset, could underperform safer bonds for incredibly long stretches, like decades, even close to a century in the U.S. case, and in basically every other country looked at. Exactly. And even the fancier risk factors, like size and value, don't reliably deliver the goods over time. That sums up the empirical challenge pretty well. The traditional risk-based models just struggle to explain these persistent patterns in the data. So... If it's not just about objective risk, what else could be driving things? What's the missing piece here, according to this research? This is the core proposal from the source material. They argue that maybe we should focus less on objective risk, measured mathematically by variance, and more on subjective fear. Fear? Like just being afraid. How does that explain markets? Well, yes, fear, but in a specific way. The paper suggests it's really about two distinct, powerful fears that influence investor behavior, and they often pull in different directions. Two fears. Okay, what are they? First, there's the fear of missing out, FOMO. Ah, FOMO. We all know that one. Right. And notice, this isn't about being afraid of losing money. It's actually a desire, almost a preference, for potential huge gains. That lottery ticket upside. In finance terms, it's related to wanting positive skew the chance of a rare but massive payoff. Okay, that makes sense. Like buying that lottery ticket, you know, the odds are bad, the risk is high in a way, but the fear of missing out if your numbers actually came up, it's powerful. Precisely. Or jumping on a hot stock trend because everyone else seems to be getting rich and you just can't stand being left behind. It's social, it's driven by narratives, not cold calculation. Right. That definitely feels like a real human emotion driving decisions. What's the second fear? The second one is the fear of loss, FOL. Fear of loss. Okay. This is much closer to the traditional idea of risk aversion, but it's specifically focused on the downside. People really, really dislike losing money. The pain of a loss feels much stronger than the pleasure of an equal size game. Yeah, that rings true. Losing $100 feels way worse than gaining $100 feels good. Exactly. That's a key insight from behavioral economics, from prospect theory. And this FOL relates more to wanting to avoid negative outcomes, or what finance calls semi-variance, just measuring the downside volatility. So, wait. Instead of just one feeling, risk aversion, mm. captured by variance, which treats big ups and big downs the same, mm -hmm. you're saying it's actually two different fears. Mm. FOMO pulls you towards those potential huge wins, wanting that upside skew. Right. And FOL pushes you away from losses, hating that downside semi variant. That's the essence of it. And this explains why variance is kind of a blunt instrument. It lumps together the feeling about potential huge gains, which FOMO might make you seek out, and potential huge losses, which FOL makes you dread. Humans just don't process them the same way. You don't fear getting rich generally. Not usually. You fear losing what you have or you fear missing out when others are getting rich. And these fears aren't constant. They're subjective. They ebb and flow based on market sentiment, news, what the crowd is doing. So the balance between FOMO and FOL in the market changes over time. That's the argument. When FOMO is dominant, maybe you get bubbles. When FOL takes over, maybe you get crashes or long periods of depressed returns because people are just too scared to invest, even if prices look cheap traditionally. This dynamic interplay might help explain that wild long-term volatility and those puzzling decades of underperformance. Okay, that's a really different way of looking at it. Fear of missing out versus fear of loss. But the source also said something interesting, that nothing is actually fear-free. 
Yes, that's another crucial point they make. There's no asset you can hold that completely eliminates all forms of fear. Not even cash. I mean, cash under the mattress or maybe treasury bills. Yeah. That seems like the ultimate safe haven, right? Zero risk. Well, it might have very low variance. The dollar amount doesn't jump around day to day, so maybe it addresses the fear of loss in terms of nominal value crashes. Okay. But it carries other fears. The big one the source highlights is the fear of losing purchasing power. Negative real returns. Oh, uh, inflation. Right. Yeah. The money is sitting there, the number looks the same, but it buys less and less stuff over time. Exactly. Your mattress cash is safe from a market crash, maybe, but inflation is quietly eating away at its value. That's a different kind of loss to fear. So, like, holding cash in 2021, 2022, when inflation spiked, you felt safe from stocks falling, but your cash was losing value fast. Precisely. The source even uses a historical example. Imagine someone got really scared in August 1929, right before the big crash. They sell everything, hold cash for 20 years until 1949. Okay, they avoided the Great Depression in stock. They did. Stocks basically went nowhere in real terms over that whole period. But holding cash, inflation averaged almost 2% per year. So over 20 years, that saved cash actually lost a significant chunk of its real purchasing power. It avoided one fear, market crashes, but succumbed to another, inflation. No truly fear-free option. Wow. Okay. So if even cash isn't fear-free and markets are driven by this tug-of-war between FOMO and FOL, mm -hmm. What does this all mean for you know the average person trying to invest? Should I just follow my gut feelings, my fears? Huh. Well, probably not just follow your gut. The source isn't saying rationality goes out the window. Investors can act rationally. Okay. But it's suggesting that understanding these underlying fears might give us a much better handle on why markets behave the way they do, especially explaining those historical patterns that simple risk theory just can't account for. So it's more about understanding the market's psychology, maybe. Partly, yes. And understanding your own psychology, too. It really challenges that easy advice that if you just hold stocks patiently, you're guaranteed a reward that perfectly matches the risk you took. The history shows that's just not always true over the timescales that matter to us as humans. Yeah. Waiting 97 years for stocks to beat bonds isn't exactly practical advice for planning retirement. Not really. So maybe the practical implication is about portfolio design instead of just trying to minimize overall variance, because again, we don't feel ups and downs the same way. Perhaps we should think more about managing the downside, addressing FOL, and maybe trying to capture some potential upside skew, appealing to FOMO, but maybe more strategically than just chasing trends. How would you do that? While the source hints at things like maybe using inflation-protected bonds, like tips, could be better at addressing the real fear of loss from inflation than standard bonds in some climates, it's about thinking more nuancedly about which fears you're trying to manage, rather than just minimizing one abstract number like variance. It depends on your personal balance of FOL and FOMO. Huh. Okay. This deep dive has uh, definitely shifted my perspectives. Not just risk and reward anymore, it feels like. Well, like human emotions, specifically these two big fears, losing versus missing out, mm. are way more central to the whole investing story than I ever realized. I think that's a great takeaway. It's kind of a call to move beyond just the elegant math, which has its place, of course, but to also embrace the, let's say, messier, more human reality of how financial decisions actually get made and how markets really work over time. So thinking about this, mm -hmm. if markets really are driven so much by fear, by FOL and FOMO, yeah. What does that suggest about your own investing habits? You know, are you maybe playing it too safe because the fear of loss is dominant for you? Or are you chasing returns, driven by fear of missing out? Just recognizing which fear might be pulling your strings. How could that change your approach? Definitely something to think about. <laughs>